Welcome to Airbus. Welcome to the We Make It Fly Airbus podcast. I'm Jeff Burridge. And I'm Martin Aguera. In this series, we're going to bring you fascinating stories of the people that have played a part in making Airbus the extraordinary company that it is today. Europe was always at the forefront of aviation well before the days of Airbus. In 1909, just six years after the Wright brothers succeeded with the first motorized flight, Louis Blériot crossed the channel from France to England by plane. He was followed by pioneers from the UK, Germany and elsewhere throughout Europe in developing new planes and advancing aviation technology. So broadly speaking, um, Jeff, um, that's our heritage. That's where we come from in Europe and that's the rich history that Airbus looks back on. And today we're going to talk about why it's so important and we're going to learn about why it's so important to preserve that heritage. Without saying too much, you've met up with uh, what we call our own night in the museum. So here I am, I'm at Aeroscopy Museum, which is just five minutes from Toulouse Airport. Looking one way, I see the airport and the A380 final assembly line, which is a massive 500 meter long structure. And they're even rolling out an A380 as I speak. It's a glorious spring day. The sun is shining, the sky is blue, and we're gonna go and meet Jacques Rocca, who is a senior member of the communications team here in Toulouse. But also today, I'm talking to him about his role as chairman of the Aviation Heritage Association in the area. So Jacques, hi, great to see you this morning. Happy to see you. <laughs> Always happy to come to see Aeroscopia. It's uh, one of my baby, I should say. So uh, really happy to join. So your baby, so uh, what's the conception of your baby? I feel a little bit like uh, Aeroscopia is my baby uh, because uh, I was really uh, uh, invest and, and really uh, engage in a team who uh, make this possible, the, the Aerocop Aeroscopia opening possible. Uh, it has been a long way, long journey uh, to uh, finalize the project. It was uh, 20 years uh, we were waiting for this museum and then uh, in 2015 uh, we opened this uh, Aeroscopia and Aeroscopia is part of our history. Okay, and so how far back does the history go here for aviation? So Jeff, I could tell you, but it's better to go inside and to see the aircraft. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> so welcome on board. <laughs> And this is the very smart entrance area that we're walking through now. We're going to use our pass to go up into the upper level of the museum here at Toulouse. We are going up because we wanted to see the main aircraft, not from the ground, but from the, the way you board into an aircraft. Okay, so we're now we're at the top of the stairs. We're looking through the corridor now, Jacques. What are we about to see? Uh, first of all, we have some uh, illustration uh, through the corridor. You can see kind of some images which give the idea of the aeronautic at the beginning. For example, we have an images of uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci with the first uh, flying machine. Uh, we have some balloon and of course some uh, photo of uh, pioneer people who were the first to fly and to experience uh, the, the, the fly. Uh, it was a bit uh, crazy at this time to to, to try to fly, but uh, some of those uh, succeed. Jack, you've been involved on the heritage for many years. Where did all this fascination start for you? Oh, I think uh, my first experience in aviation uh, was when I was uh, very, very young, because uh, my father was uh, flying small aircraft in the north of Toulouse. He was uh, taking me every time to the, to the airfield. My first experience of uh, flying was uh, uh, there. And of course, as a young uh, 
a boy, uh, I, I made some models of aircraft. Then my really first impressive experience was to see Concorde. When I was nine years old, in uh, 1970, and uh, Concorde was uh, at the aerospatial factory close to the airport, and we were there, and I was just below Concorde, close to the wing and close to the landing gear. And the wheel higher than me, it was really, really, really impressive for me. So we're now coming up to the Super Guppy. It's an eight meter wide fuselage, which is huge. And you see this cavernous black hole and the whole front end of the aircraft is opened up. So you're looking really just at a straight cro cross section of the aircraft. Jack, what was the Super Guppy used for? Uh, Super Guppy was one of uh, the key uh, tools for Airbus because at the beginning, of course, we started by transporting parts from each factory in Europe by boat and by road, but it was a nightmare. So having so big parts of aircraft uh, to transport, then we decided to rent uh, four Super Guppy and uh, the Super Guppy was uh, the only way to transport from each our factory uh, the part of the A300. At this time, it was uh, in the early 1970s. OK, so we move away from the Super Guppy and we're walking now along this fabulous balcony past many models of uh, various aircraft, including the uh, complete Airbus family in its various liveries from past years. We're walking past the A300B, which looks amazing in this hangar, and we'll come back to that in a moment as we head down now towards one of the first Concorde. So yes, uh, we will uh, enter into the Concorde, but first of all, a uh, few words on the, this balcony and, and these models. These models are reflecting uh, what uh, was uh, uh, manufactured and produced from the beginning of the 20th century in Toulouse, especially in Toulouse. You have Lateco aircraft, you have De Voitin aircraft, and then you have the ATR family as well, and of course the full Airbus family, as you said. Uh, but uh, we have also an history of uh, the, 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 the reason of why we moved from these aircraft to the Concorde or to the H-100. Concorde was to transport people very fast uh, and A300 was the first answer of the growth in aeronautics. Okay, so we're walking towards the A300B, Jacques. Yes, the A300 is something very different. So this aircraft was supposed to transport 250 people uh, in comfortable seats. Uh, and cabin. Okay, so we're walking through the fuselage past some fancy seats and there's a video playing giving the history of, uh, of Airbus as we walk through, so that's probably why you can hear the, the Muzak in the background. And we're moving from a 242 configuration through what's in the next section. Ah, we have more, this is more business, this is more what we would all like to enjoy, I think. This is two six seats across, I would probably. Six seats, yeah. and uh, of course, uh, here we are in uh, something uh, uh, you never see when you fly in an aircraft. It's a corporate aircraft, and uh, all this uh, fuselage and this cabin has been uh, uh, drawn by our colleagues from several associations, and they wanted to show what you can expect or what you can have in a so big aircraft and wide body. So here we are in a corporate part with a meeting room. Then we will see a bedroom, a kitchen, uh, all you can have in a corporate aircraft. So Jacques, one of the reasons we're here today and on this aircraft, A300B, is the reason why we started to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Airbus where it all began. Uh, and it was very significant for the company. Yes, uh, the A300 is uh, the most iconic uh, success of Airbus because it was the first uh, Airbus aircraft. And uh, it has been very difficult at the beginning to sell the aircraft. 
and uh, the of course uh, Lufthansa Air France uh, bought the first one but we were expecting uh, for a new big order and we were expecting to to have some success outside of Europe and the first big order significant order came from Eastern Airlines and then this order made the success of Airbus because it has been the starting point. And then we convinced several other airlines that this aircraft, the A300, was really efficient, really eco-efficient, and uh, that it was perfectly fitted with what they need in terms of uh, increasing their capacity of transportation. And we, at the end, we made uh, more than 800 A300. So it was a bit of a gamble for the new company to, to launch such a, uh, a big program and project within Europe and, and trying to sell that globally as well as within Europe was a, a first. Clearly, yes. And um, it was not uh, uh, easy uh, to consider that uh, 50 years later uh, we will be... Uh, uh, one of the key manufacturers in, in the world for aircraft, of course. It was not so obvious at the beginning. We had the know-how in terms of uh, aircraft design, aircraft manufacturing, but uh, the key point is to have the market. And uh, convincing airlines to change their mindset and to buy European aircraft with new generation uh, jet engines uh, was... Uh, very challenging at this time. And for a few years, we had no orders. So our people in our factory were just uh, painting building, gardening. Uh, it was another, uh, it was not... Uh, different times. Yeah, clearly different <laughs> times. <laughs> okay, we're walking along the ground floor now of the museum around 25, 30 aircraft around us. We were just walking up to the wheels of the Concorde, Jacques, and you're a lot taller now than you were a few years ago. Yeah, yes, uh, it's sure that I was uh, very small when I went to see the Concorde for the first time, but it's still very impressive. The landing gear of Concorde, it's big and it's really impressive. We also, we just, we can see the Corvette, another significant aircraft. Or the Corvette is a significant aircraft because it was used for several times as a kind of a shuttle between our sites. And uh, this aircraft was connecting Toulouse to Meholt, uh, Filton in the UK, Saint-Nazaire, Nantes, uh, with our engineers. So every day it was easy to book your seat on a Corvette and to fly from Toulouse. One hour later you were in your meeting in Saint-Nazaire or in Filton. What's this? We're looking at uh, some sort of igloo in front of us. Yes, it's an igloo uh, which has been uh, uh, installed by, uh, by Airbus and uh, it's a place where you can see what uh, could be the future of aviation. Even be able to fly in formation like migrating birds or join together in flight. It's funny because this movie has been uh, produced already 10 years ago. So we know already that what we was considering as the future for aviation 10 years ago becomes a bit wrong now. And then we will uh, fine tune for the next 50 years what could be the future of aviation. Here the public could see um, how a manufacturer um, try to anticipate what will be the future, taking into account the uh, sustainability of aviation, taking into account the growth of aviation and how to answer to this uh, challenge. Okay, I mean, if you think what's been achieved in the first 50 years of uh, Airbus, I mean, it's quite amazing or quite hard to think what could be achieved in the next 50 years. You can't say that uh, it will be sure uh, what you are uh, thinking, but uh, you should. Uh, it's it's uh, it's mandatory, uh, and it's your job to should to try to anticipate and and to have some idea on what could be the next challenge. We just spoke about the future of flight there, Jacques, and and we're now standing right next to the E-Fan, which is 
uh, a very early version, small aircraft with electric propulsion. Could you tell us something about that one? Uh, this small aircraft, it's roughly 10 meters uh, of uh, wingspan uh, and two small electric engines on each side. So this small aircraft is uh, the first step in electrification in aviation. Uh, the first step to demonstrate that uh, we can fly with passenger on board uh, with engine propellers and, and uh, engine uh, electric uh, engines. So it's a, it's a new step and of course it's linked to how we should change the propelling system and the engine system on, on aircraft uh, to power aircraft with electricity instead of uh, powering with fuel. So stepping outside, we're just now standing by another Concorde and also the Airbus A400M. Tell us something about that, Jacques. We are very proud to have these two aircraft. This Concorde is a MSN9, the one which was the last aircraft, last Concorde aircraft to fly in France. It was in June 2004 and it landed in, in Toulouse. Uh, with some uh, key VIP on board. André Turca, first pilot of Concorde, uh, flight test pilot of Concorde, and he was on board. And then you can see A400M. This aircraft, because it's a flight test aircraft, was supposed to be dismantled at the end of his life, technical life. But we said on the Airbus Heritage side, we said, please keep this aircraft. The cabin has been refurbished a little bit to give the access to the public and they are every time very impressed to go inside the cabin of such military aircraft and to see how it's large and, and big and to understand what is the meaning of such aircraft. Okay, Jack, we're drawing to a close from our tour today. Thanks very much. It's great to have such a personal walk around with you and I can feel the passion you have for such uh, iconic uh, aviation artefacts that we have around us. How does it make you feel? When I am in Aeroscopia, I feel uh, comfortable because it's my passion so with all these aircraft and, and feel proud a little bit. When I joined Aerospatial in 1997, that I understood and that I realized that there is a, a very important history, uh, patrimonial history, heritage, which, which should be protected. And uh, it's a reason why I'm uh, so engaged in supporting this heritage. It means something personal because, of course, I heard about Concorde when I was uh, very young. I saw Concorde, I saw Caravelle, all these aircraft when I was young. So maybe it's part of my DNA. So um, it's a reason why I feel comfortable when I'm here. I can say something else. Great piece, Jeff. I'm a history buff myself. For many years in my free time, I've been preserving uh, military aviation uh, items because I grew up in an area in Germany where we had lots of uh, military aviation. So I can relate to a lot of what uh, Jacques talked to you about. It takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication, a lot of love and passion to create such a museum, to preserve all those artifacts that they have. And to make it interesting for people to see. And uh, so that's why I have a lot of admiration for, for Jacques and, and the people uh, working at the Aeroscopia because what they do is something I, I believe in. I, I think it's great. And um, I guess, Jeff, you know, that must have been uh, an impressive, an amazing uh, walk down the memory lane for you. Yeah, it was, Martin, it was. Jack is another example of someone who's got real passion for for aviation generally, not just for our own products as well. And for me, walking from Concorde to the A300 was a real transition. I used to work on Concorde. The last couple of years of Concorde's life, I was involved in a couple of projects, including the toilet refurbishment, which my family think is hilarious. Um, and then going into A300, the first aircraft for Airbus and where it all really started and 
um, you really got a sense of that history of the company. So yeah, it was a great day. That's a great conclusion uh, to this episode. Thank you, Jeff. That concludes our edition of the We Make It Fly podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed it, please like it and review it. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on all social media. Use simply the hashtag Airbus Podcast to get in touch with us. As always, your feedback is welcomed. Good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter. We want to know what you think about this podcast. This program was made by Earshot Strategies. The executive producer is Richard Myron and other production undertaken by Anub Mie. I'm Martin Aguera and I was joined by Jeff Burridge. Thank you for listening and until next time. Thank you.